I'd like to introduce Mark McCready from the British Esports Association, and we're going to have a wee look at how to um, run an esports club in your school. Hi there, everyone. Um, my name is Mark. I actually need to remember to look at the camera for this. Um, but it's great to be speaking to you today um, and to run through a couple of the different opportunities around esports and education. Um, I will quickly summarise what we're going to be do going through today. Uh, the first few slides sort of summarise up anyways, um, but sort of delay a little bit to see if there's anybody else jumping in. Um, but realistically, we're wanting to run through a bit more about what esports is um, and what you can use with it and have a better understanding about what um, essentially competitive video gaming is. Um, as I, I know you might have some um, idea of what it entails, um, but within an education environment, it might be a bit of uh, misty waters of how do you navigate this space. Um, but I'll we'll move firstly over to the next slide. There we go. Um, so yeah, my name is Mark McCready. Um, I'm currently the Scottish Liaison Officer for the British Esports Association um, and also an Education Assistant on the Education Team. Um, so really what my roles involve is the Scottish Liaison Officer. I speak to people like yourself, um, academics, teachers, lecturers uh, across the education system to basically showcase and learn a bit more about what esports entails and provide those sort of academic pathways throughout. Um, I also speak to the likes of George uh, and his team around the different opportunities as well and how we could potentially work together um, along with speaking to councillors, uh, different uh, members of the teams on council boards, uh, local governments um, and as a wider uh, help assist the UK government as well um, on their advisory boards and trade. On the education side uh, I've helped basically develop some of the teaching materials but along with my colleagues as education is one of those pathways for me personally. I'd like to get a lot more involved in um, following the footsteps of my sister a little bit here. Um, but looking into the education space is it's something I've always loved and enjoyed as well and especially connecting the two with esports. Um, but really where I came into esports um, was about four years ago. I've recently just graduated from university. Um, and went to do human biology, so it may not seem a bit related as of yet. Um, but four years ago, I picked esports up as more of a hobby. Um, I'd always played games with friends during high school, um, but moving to university, it's a big move in your life, in your career, and you don't really know what to expect. Um, and when I ended up at university, I started looking for different opportunities to meet new friends and create new experiences. And one of the things that we started was um, I reached out to an organisation called Esports Scotland, uh, which is an events company in Scotland, and they run the Scottish Esports League, um, which is essentially the equivalent of your Scottish Football League. We basically, at that point, it was going through, we want to make this something of a staple point. So we pulled this together um, and we ended up developing what is now just been Scottish Esports League season four. Um, and now going into season five, um, which was a fantastic experience. I moved on to um, basically focus a bit more on the university side of things um, as I was entering into my second year of university, um, and I really wanted to create more opportunities on campus. Um, and that's where I ended up creating the Esports Society, or the Monarchs Esports Society, um, back in 2019, um, where... I basically um, reached out to the Student Association, uh, spoke to the, the per current president, vice presidents, and developed an eSports society which now has over 60 members. Um, and I'm still quite good friends with the people that I was involved with back at university um, over the past two years. Um, that sort of looked at where we can go from just a society and a university, connect with other societies, let's create a lot more uh, opportunities we're playing games, we're making teams to compete in esports competitions. How can we connect with your Edinburgh universities, your Glasgow universities, um, and head it what, et cetera. So that moved to creating an esports network to connect all the students across Scotland uh, of about nearly 2,000 students that are registered and competing on behalf of their esports societies um, just in the university space uh, alone, of which 
15 universities in Scotland have an esports team um, and compete on a weekly basis in a, a university level with the NSC or National Student Esports or the NUEL, um, which is the National University Esports League. Um, but that really comes on to where I've been with Esports and Education Conference, um, helping really set up the framework in Scotland around education and using esports in that space um, and developing things at like the Scottish College Cup and the Minecraft or the main, my, ugh, Microsoft Esports Teacher Academy, um, which we done in July last year. So British Esports is an organisation. Um, it was established in 2016 uh, under the Culture Minister, uh, Sajid David at the time, um, who basically approved us to set up as a na the national body for esports in the UK. Um, we're the only one in the UK uh, with government approval at that level. We're not government funded, um, so we're a not-for-profit national body and we don't receive any government funding. Um, but our whole purpose is like I was saying, of my specific role is to to basically promote esports throughout the UK and um, improve the standards of esports, and um, so we can actually have as a fully recognised functioning uh, industry, and um, but also inspire future talent because realistically, it's the young people that are driving this industry forward, and it's our sort of responsibilities to help direct those pathways and help create them and support young people on their journey through whether that's academic or through their careers. So, like I was saying, we're going to cover a little bit about what esports is, um, focusing into a little bit more of the education pathways uh, of uh, career progression, and then a couple of things to showcase what you can do as a school, um, where you can create your own club, and what activities you can do, and really just stimulate some different ideas of what's already been happening. Um, and using some examples throughout Scotland as well of, of what you can use as a sort of basic uh, level of entry. So what is eSports? So I, I touched on earlier, or it's organised competitive video gaming. Um, and it's always a human to human, so there's no computer involved. It's always one person against another and using their skill and knowledge of the game itself to beat one another using a computer. Um, it is always a game of skill. Um, you're not looking to pay for things and have disadvantages um, that you're not trying to pay to get a better team, for example. It's always usually a level balance and it's down to your raw skill and material uh, that you can work with. And a lot of people have coined it as a new modern mind game um, of chess 2.0. Um, I've heard a couple of times and people looking at it as a sport of computer science. Um, because it really does have a lot of open potential. But I've just put up a couple of games or esports titles here to showcase what sort of ranges and genres, because esports as a whole is sort of like saying sports. Um, it's very difficult to say what is esports and just try to go down one route. You have things like sports games, racing games, uh, which ties into a bit of sim racing or simulated racing. You have your sort of fighting games that tie into a lot of your martial arts aspects um, and even things that your battle royales is. I can guarantee most of you might have heard of Fortnite um, and probably from somebody under the age of 12 um, in the past few years. So it's, it's a really all-round engaging tool for a lot of young people. Um, and I think a lot of young people are now starting to recognize they are participating in esports but it's not really been known because there's not a lot of support or resources out there for them to fully understand what they really do in this space. Um, but it is something that can be gender neutral. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your gender, your religious views, um, the color of your skin. It doesn't matter. Um, it's completely down to you as an individual and your skill. Um, and it creates great opportunities to work as an individual in some esports titles. A lot of fighting games are individual basis or you can work as a team whether that's something like FIFA, Rocket League or playing basketball for example um, which we can relate a bit more to sports on but as a sp uh, fantastic great spectator uh, exhibition and we usually see a lot of people um, getting involved with but it's also important to note it's not recognized in the UK as a as a sport it's its own section and um, it's classed under the entertainment as a game um, so something to be aware of, if you look at France, France actually recognises it as a sport, 
in a couple of different countries around the world really haven't figured out what category to put it in because it is so new and emerging. Um, another thing which I don't have on here is the way you spell esports. You might have sort of uh, recollection from using email, how it used to be spelled e hyphen mail, um, and now it's been changed to just email as one word. Some people end up putting a capital S in the middle of esports as an electronic capital sport. Um, because it is its own thing, um, it's kept as just esports all lowercase or a capital E with sports um, afterwards. It's really important as an educator to understand this, um, and it may be a bit pernickety, but it's something that a lot of industry and a lot of people looking in the education space um, will be very critical of it. Um, because it's a sign of not fully understanding the industry. Um, and it's something that there has been some, not back in the past few years, with other education institutions um, across the UK and internationally and not being fully recognised or believed to be authentic, if you will. So, actually, I picked this photo. Um, there's amplitude of photos that you can pick off the internet around esports events um, but this is actually one that stands out to me because there's a lot to take just from the angle and what's in this photo and um, so this is the international 2019 and um, which is the world championships essentially or the world cup for a game called dota 2 which is a five versus five online multiplayer battle arena um, you can have a look up to see a bit more information about it but for the sake of this it's the biggest uh, prize pool uh, in the in out of all the esports titles. Um, in 2019, it was 34 million. Uh, this year, it was 56 million. Um, so it's consistently getting bigger and bigger. Um, and you're seeing 18 teams compete all within Shanghai and China within this arena over what could be about a month. Um, and they're all invited from Brazil, America, um, Russia, parts of Europe even into the likes of Africa as well. It's really world inclusive. But what I like about this photo is you see the big arena, you see the big screens, the lights, and that ties into the production elements. And um, you've got the event side of it with all the players or all the spectators coming along, ties into your production aspects, but you have a lot more if you look a bit deeper into this. Um, you actually have culture um, being brought in of a welcoming ceremony um, taking place within China and Shanghai where they've put on local cultural traditions to welcome people in. If you just see underneath uh, the big screen in the middle, you've got an entire orchestra and it's important of the entire atmosphere engaging through music as well. But we also have in the bottom right your production and broadcast aspects uh, and even your little booths down the front. I think there's three booths, uh, one in the middle, one to the right, one to the left. Um, where we'll have essentially casters, sort of off-screen uh, shows, like your um, sports benches where you've got your Gary Nevels or your Jamie Carragher sitting talking about the game beforehand in the middle and after. So that is really inclusive and it can be really uh, supported by what you see in football or other sports. But what you'd want to know is where does this tie into an educational setting? Um kids really like playing video games. Um, and I don't think any of us can question that. I think half the time we're looking to get them away from it. And by today, we're not trying to encourage them to play more video games. What we're trying to understand is why do they play it in the first place? Um, and it's some of the benefits that you can see from young people engaging in this industry in the first hand. So we look at their happiness, how positive psychology behind it, the fact that where we talk about them playing games with their friends is antisocial, but they're actually talking to their friends on a daily basis, just in a different, unique way to what we traditionally know of. We know it aids and focuses their concentration. Um, I know a lot of them, I know from trying to get them down for dinner, um, they're very focused, they're very concentrated. And these are skills we want to harness um, and we want to bring into their, their everyday life. Um, and there's things around learning more about how to win and lose as well. If they're playing games all the time, where you take a kid out to play football on a Sunday or a Saturday morning and they lose, 
you can tell how it impacts them um, on a, a mental well-being level and it's important to just understand what that means to them and um, if they play for their local football team and they're playing uh, every week and they're not winning it has a negative effect on them but it's the resilience aspects how can we support them how can we use this to their advantage so they can build up that resilience um, and how can we impact that in their lives and we do see a lot of leadership skills and um, communication these are core elements to particularly team esports where you have to provide strategies you have to look at tactics when you're playing against your rivals you want to know how do i beat them what's their weak points um, and at the end of it they do get a lot of intrinsic rewards um, around the recognition of what they're doing and um, if you're playing football within the school you're going to get recognition if you win you're going to feel good so you'll probably think that you're the best in the school because you've won the game and you get picked for the school team and these are things we want to encourage is these positive reinforcements and benefits of young people um, and even just the quote there from Professor J uh, Janet Eyre around uh, essentially the impact it has at a psychological level or a neuroscience level. Um, but it is important, although we should all play, it's everything in moderation and as part of a balanced life. Um, and it's being realistic about playing the games for fun and not doing it constantly where it starts to have negative effects in your life. So I just wanted to share some of these statistics um, around the online space. So Twitch is a platform for online streaming. Um, it's similar to YouTube where a lot of people come on but they live stream so they can't upload their content to it. Um, they'll only stream it out um, at a live feed. So it's actually a fantastic industry all around and it's one that was based off of video games but has now become a lot more. Um, and it really does harness a lot of the younger generation, as shown here, about 41%. But it does have a lot of impact on, on what young people do, especially when they're online looking at your social media, but also looking at video games and Twitter. Um, and one of the, the things, actually, uh, that I quite liked um, was looking at different forms of media. Because we have social media, which we have people online looking, reading things, posting about their lives. And that's a very social aspect to it. But then we have things like watching TV, um, where TV doesn't necessarily have a lot of positive benefactors when you're watching things like reality TV shows. And I like to kind of refer to that more as static uh, media because you're not doing anything, you're not physically up and moving. And for a lot of the time, you're not purely learning uh, a lot of different things. And then you've got active media where you're physically and mentally engaged in what you're doing um, on a media basis. And that's something that esports harnesses because you're mentally and physically engaged in what's happening on the screen um, and you're working with other friends around you. And like I'm saying, this is an emerging industry. If we even go back a couple of years before this, it was still around, but it's nowhere near the growth of what it has now. Um, we're starting to see it a lot more frequently, especially in Scotland. Um, we are seeing an esports arena being developed in Dundee, um, and that's looking at 2024. So by that time, from the announcement back in 2020, you can probably expect it to double um, at that point, and it will be twice the size of audience uh, by the time we get to 2024. So I want to touch a bit more about career progression um, and where to go next. So I've actually got a bit of an interactive task because I'd like to get what you think so far about what I've talked about, the esports industry, the different pathways that are there. Um, and I think this is a good opportunity to sort of open the chat up a little bit to see what you have expectations wise that if a young person comes up to you, you would know what sort of angle they can go down, what careers are there in the industry. I don't know if chat's open for everyone, but I'm... So game development, yep. Game design's military, yep. There's 
I think the military has been one of the biggest adopters of video games in general and game design because of the simulation aspects where they can use it to simulate this entire environment. Oh, we've got a lot coming in. <laughs> Gonna have to keep up here. <laughs> Light sound engineer, yep. Casters, coaches, Martin publishing social media. Nutritionists. Uh, yep. Especially from even personally my background of human biology, looking into just the the impact and the benefits of of the ex physical exercise, but mental exercise as well. Which this is more of a mental exercise area around it. Merchandise and referee. Probably jobs we don't have even have yet. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's probably a lot more coming out. But yeah, I think there's there's a lot there's a lot in there around the different and you're not even just sticking to games, which I'm I'm glad to see is there's a lot there's there's a larger range of activities out there and careers out there than just the games industry aspect. And I think that's a very important part around esports as a whole is it's not just about the game itself it's around what the game enables on a, a sort of wider scale outside oh. and I went back a slide there so yeah here's actually a, a, a table that I put together um, I might have stolen it from the Education Teacher Academy. Um, but it's, I, I think it's fantastic of outlining everything that's there. Um, you do have your eSports orgs where players sign to. You can look into your, um, your, your sort of performance aspects, which we associate with traditional teams. Um, your tournaments, your events, your organizers running these leagues, like the Scottish eSports League that I was talking about, apparel, clothes design, uh, streaming platforms, hardware to get even computers put together in the first place. Um, we're even touching into communications, journalism, and then the sponsors aspect of working as a, a brand manager within organizations of how to promote your brand. And esports is one of these platforms that brands are really looking at to engage with young people. Um, we're even seeing the likes of Red Bull been heavily involved uh, all the way down to the likes of Samsung, um, Intel. There's a lot of big, and I think one of the, the best ones seen, that just reminded me there is Marvel. Marvel used it to basically introduce itself to the, the industry of esports where one of the teams got their kits made so you can get a Captain America jersey which has the Team Liquid logo on it. There's a lot of great examples out there of like Spider-Man as well. Um, Thor, Iron Man, and it really took off. Essentially, there's a lot of people got involved with that brand. I've highlighted publishers in this um, for when I developed the uh, the table you see, because publishers are at the core of it. They're the ones that are essentially creating the games and the esports titles. And as they move on, they are the ones that have full control over it. They are essentially the governing bodies of esports. Um, it's one of the things where you'd look towards something like the Scottish Football Association, but it would actually be FIFA, essentially, who have developed and basically maintained the rules of football. Um, although it's a bit different because, for example, EA Sports can come out and release a brand new game, but they would still be the, the publisher, even though, or the sort of governing body, even though it might not fit into any of the categories below. But another on this actually is national associations um, or national bodies like British Esports is another avenue. That's another uh, graph that was produced with um, Pearson uh, when we were producing the Esports BTEC, uh, which starts to link a lot of the things together. We covered a couple of the transferable skills. We've spoke a lot about, about the, the sort of careers and the roles. But this really highlights a little bit more about how they connect together and where they stem into. 
um, and the, how these transferable skills move into the roles in different careers in tech and digital. Move on to the next one. This one might be a little hard to see. I don't know if on the on your screens if you can see this, um, but this sort of shows the the sort of spider diagram. Nicolas uh, Bassoms, which is um, a researcher from France, had actually produced this, um, and it went quite viral across the internet when it started, where education started popping up into the the esports space, um, and it really signifies and cements how beneficial esports can be used as an industry because all these relate to esports but it also relates to other industries and um, these roles are available in every other industry that's out there um, and they're all transferable as well at the same time and another one i'd like to show so this is actually taken from the uh, perspectives from the btec in esports that we do um, so this is the Pearson BTEC Level 3. Although it may not be applicable to yourselves, I think it's just important to have a look at the units that we produced within it. Um, because there's 20 units, and essentially when we developed the BTEC, we were told we need 20 units. What are those 20 units? And we were like, wait a minute, there's a lot more units we could do around this. But we had to find the ones that would actually have the best support and impact within um, the, the education uh, institutions, so making sure they had the facilities to there. But there's a lot of different areas that you can break down, reaching from the health and well-being aspects that we're talking about, nutritionists and performance, and things that game design that were touched on with the coding aspects and looking into things like web design, etc., um, into business and um, video production, creative medias, and um, even into things like ethical and current issues um, in law within the space and actually understanding how that law from a national level translates into international as well as we're now seeing a lot more athletes travel across and have to get visas um, to compete within different countries and um, there are actually esports visas now being developed I believe America just developed one Germany has one as well because it's quite known for being a hub for welcoming players back into and um, compete for national or major leagues like the league of legends european championships but yeah i thought that's a good point so i think i've been speaking for about half an hour now um for me to <laughs> sort of take a little rest stop talking for a little bit and if you have any questions so far on what we've uh, discussed just before we move on to the sort of schools and further education side of what you can do and the activities that are out there for for you to get involved with in the skills. But if there's any questions you have, you can take five minutes um, and we can chat over some of the different questions you may have already. The SQ are working on an esports MPA. So originally we were contacted around the, the from the SQ about a, a qualification. Um, Right now, we're speaking to them about how that can work with us. Um, we've already developed the PTEC with Pearson uh, for the rest of the UK, and we do want to be involved with Scotland. Um, so we're just currently talking about how that could potentially work uh, for moving forward. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Andrew Gibson, I can understand. Yep. So uh, actually, there's what we're going to be coming on to talk about. We'll answer that really heavily. Um, and it ties around things that we do with our student championships. Um, it, I think the, the important part with esports titles is that you, you need to know the students that are playing. Um, there's so many esports titles out there. Some are more popular which means there's more things happening around them. Um, you might have a 12-year-old or 13-year-old come and say, can I play Call of Duty? Can we get a Call of Duty team? Of which, although it's a peg rated 18, 
um, as long as there's adult supervision because PEGI ratings aren't enforced. But it's sort of been realistic and appropriate with the, the PEGI ratings as well. To do. How are pupils with severe and complex needs included? Actually, that's a good question. Um, I actually have a slide of this coming up, which I can talk about more detail. But like I was saying earlier around esports is very inclusive. Um, it's one of these industries that, like I was saying, it doesn't matter who you are as an individual. Um, it really just comes down to the playing aspect because online it's anonymous. You don't actually have to to worry about who you are, um, anything about you. It's entirely anonymous, and it's very inclusive to where if you had a disability, um, if you had um, any uh, health conditions, nobody would know about them unless you openly announced it. Um, there's nothing that would, would actually impact them in their uh, participation in esports. Oh, bye, Charles. Thanks for coming along. And yeah, I think a good one to touch on right now is the Digital Extra Fund that George put in. The Digital Extra Fund um, provides funding to get some equipment into the school, but it's tied around um, using computing science skills. So you could run something like an esports club, um, but you would be looking to run something of the sorts of a, a coding club alongside it and relate the two in together um, and whether that is looking a bit more at the streaming aspects um, and setting up for example uh, a sort of website for the school uh, esports team using html and java and javascript that's the sort of stuff that you would be looking towards the basic it requirements required to run most of the games some of the games can be pretty competitive um, in terms of hardware, um, there are a lot of entry-level games out there. Um, entry-level in terms of their low hardware requirements um, and their low costs as well. Um, a lot of these games are now becoming free. But yeah, I'll move over into the next slide to talk a bit more about the schools and further education side of it. Yeah, so actually, Kevin, I'll answer this in the uh, the next section here, um, because what something that we do run is the British Esports uh, Championships, um, or Student Champs, which is a competition designed for schools and colleges across the UK. Um, it's open for twelve students that are twelve years or older. Um, and it goes into the further education side as well. So to really touch on, we have, it's, it's basically an exclusive PC-based competition, um, and it's the only thing of its kind in the UK right now um, for schools and colleges. We've just had over 400 teams register, um, and I believe that's going to be a bit higher with this split, but that was for winter um, from September to uh, December. We had just over 400 teams um, and then just over 180 sign up for this split as well. Um, in July last year, we actually held a, a grand finale um, down in Nottingham at Confetti Institute, um, where we were basically got all the final teams that made it to the finals and um, come along. They could basically meet um, professionals from within the industry that can give a bit of advice and support. We had a fantastic um, coach then called Gregan, um, who was the head coach of the Rocket League team for David Beckham's organization, Guild Esports, who went in beforehand and actually gave them a bit of one-to-one -one, um, coaching to help support them and give them a bit of advice um, and answer any questions they may have. Um, but it's also, we're the official esports partner um, of esports um, within the colleges. So 
we've partnered up with the, the likes of the Association of Colleges for the UK, and we've also partnered up with College Development Network to basically help support and provide the same sort of assistance as what the SFA do for the school leagues and what Scottish Rugby would do for the rugby leagues. So we're trying to basically position ourselves in a good position to or a good point where we can support teachers and we can support schools get more involved in the space. Um, and one of the things that we're, we're quite proud of is the engagement that we've had from it. Um, in July, we actually had about 10,000 uh, concurrent viewers watching um, at one point where we were front page of Twitch to the entire UK. So whenever you turned it on, the students were being represented from their school um, or their college across the UK at that point. And I think this is, just goes to show, this is one of the schools um, that were there. Uh, this is a sixth form school. Um, and they just get their kits done up. Um, so one of the things that we've agreed with um, Raven.gg, which is an esports apparel uh, company, is you can get, I believe, 10% off of your um, kit and you get a free design as well of of your school jersey. And this is the the Falcons, I believe they've called themselves, um, basically representing themselves at Confetti back in July. Uh, this is the main stage. Um, so there was about a 200 seat um, theatre where we had people come from all over the UK to come and represent and um, also watch and get inspired from high school students participating um, along with college students as well at the same time. We also had Scottish champions. Um, so we had Forth Valley College come down um, and they won Division 2 of the Rocket League um, finals. Um, you could definitely tell the Scots were in the room. Um, we were definitely jumping and cheering along and brought the atmosphere from, from Scotland down. But this also covers another aspect. Um, last year we partnered with National Star to provide a pilot for people with disabilities um, to basically get involved um, because providing the inclusion and accessibility to people that might not have that traditionally uh, with sports, it opens up a new barrier because having a disability doesn't put you at any other disadvantage with any sports. Um, there's difficulties with, if you aren't able-bodied, getting onto a pitch um, to play football. There are physical barriers in place. Just like George has actually put in the, the chat, we partnered up with Microsoft off, uh, Microsoft um, and the Xbox to provide this adaptive controller. Um, so on your screen right now is actually one of the students um, from National Star who wanted to come along and showcase the final of our, our pilot. Um, I believe he actually had uh, cerebral palsy um, and he uses the buttons um, and pads on uh, his headrest to his different buttons as well and he actually had this adaptive controller and was playing FIFA um, against another student from National Star but they also participated in a national um, AOC colleges competition where they played anonymously online and not a single person knew they had an ability and they left that experience thrilled because it's something they've never had to do before uh, or never been able to do sorry um, and it really had a positive impact on them and wanting to do it again. Um, and one of the, the lecturers has actually spoken to my colleague Tom saying one of them actually got a little upset about it because they lost. But the reality is this was the first time they were able or realised they could actually play FIFA um, using their disability as well and what they've got uh, to use their, their buttons, their headrests, uh, pressure pads, that was their first opportunity. So when that put in perspective of you can practice, like you can do something engaging and fun, um, it's something to really highlight um, because it creates that inclusion barrier uh, or removes that inclusion barrier for, for schools and colleges across the UK um, and particularly for young people to get involved, which they've not been able to in the past. Um, and it really did have a, um, a, a positive impact and effect on on their lives. <clears throat> what sort of price range would the school be looking at? The link actually there for the adaptive controller, um, you could have a look to see. Um, 
Do, 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 do. Here we go. So the adaptive controller itself uh, is £75 uh, from the website I just seen there. So it's something to have a look at as well. Um, even a couple of them, like two of them, would be suitable, I believe, for most uh, skills. But some might need to spend more depending on the demand. But there are a lot of different uh, equipment out there that can be used to basically provide that other alternative and opportunity to get involved. So one of the things, actually, I'll go back slightly here. Go back to the student champs. So we actually run uh, four games in the student champs. Um, we run League of Legends, Overwatch, and Rocket League. Um, both of them, or all of them, are low entry requirements. Um, so the idea behind this was to create entry level uh, esport title competitions. Rocket League is a three versus three, um, and I usually recommend that because it's a low number count to form a team. Um, League of Legends as well is five versus five, and it's more of a fantasy based off of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and Overwatch is an an FPS action game, um, which is age appropriate as well to twelve and plus or twelve year olds and plus. Um, Valorant is eighteen plus, um, or sorry, sixteen plus restricted, so it would only be available to senior uh, pupils that were within the school and um, that are older than sixteen or are sixteen. Um, and that's more of a mature esports title that's out there um, for them to get involved with. But they are very low cost. Uh, the only game we run that has a price tag to it is Overwatch, um, which I believe is about £16, £17. Pounds. Um, but if you had a low entry um, PC, you can get involved. A lot of the systems that we have, we have a student handbook that I can send out with uh, George afterwards which showcases a, a sort of um, entry build of what you can look to expect, which breaks down all the parts um, from your processor, motherboards, etc., with the cost attached to them um, for running these games, or you can get a PC for the, re uh, the recommended. It's really down to what you would be looking to do with the equipment. What we've tried to say is if you are looking to have these PCs within the school, it's not just to play games. Playing games is that engagement tool. It's the club aspect gets them involved, but it's the activities you can do on that, whether that's the creative media aspects of video production, uh, running your own stream, coding, these sort of environments that you want to provide for young people to learn. Back over. A lot of the case, yeah, um, usually there's a graphics card. Um, a lot of skills computers, I believe, don't have a graphics card, but the processor and the RAM that are in them are enough to run these games. Um, but it is looking at within the school environment as well of can that be opened up on a, a council level. Part of what we've got right now is we produced a, a parent and carers guide for the NSPCC or with the NSPCC. Um, this was basically to help provide a good outline of what you can do um, and how you can support young people online. And actually when speaking to parents and teachers or carers, it's a start to finish guide on what esports is. And also if you're looking at careers, how that's realistic possible putting it blatantly out there of it's the same if a student turns around and says they want to be a footballer and um, you have to be realistic and say that might not be possible it is a pathway but there are other careers out there in esports that you can get involved with and this is one of the the key areas that we've tackled around what we do with our student champs is that we try to create a safe environment working directly with the schools um, and making sure our safeguarding policies are up to high standard um, and always continuously looking to, to make it safer online um, and creating the safest possible. Um, 
and it's a, a guide as well to help you understand how you can help develop an online safe environment. And if there are any concerns of what's happened, whether that's something being said over a game, that can be highlighted to us and you can flag that up to us uh, through safeguard at britishesports.org. But I, actually, I want to use this little section here to talk a bit more about Alva Academy. So Alva Academy is the first school in Scotland to get involved um, and it was run by Emma Liston who's a music teacher um, at Alva Academy and she's done fantastic pieces of work across getting her uh, school involved in esports. Um, she's had barriers to having internet access and having it blocked by the council um, because of uh, firewalls but that's something that needs to have an open discussion moving forward and looking to address that um, so that we can provide these opportunities to young people um, and not blocking it off. But something she's looked to do is create a social media account where she's been able to connect with the wider esports industry to showcase what the school has been doing. Um, and through that, that's actually connected her up with basically sponsor brands like GT Omega, uh, which is based in Glasgow, or HyperX, which is a large peripheral um, hardware uh, company, and even Belong Arenas, which is the gaming uh, or game owns it as the, the gaming arenas across the UK as well, um, who helps provide her with some of the kit uh, that she has in the school. Now, she has actually an esports arena or facility within the school, and that's a high-end example. Um, that's something that was very fortunate to have put in place um, and costs quite a bit, but it's not something that you realistically need to have. And I understand not a lot of schools will have access to be able to do that. Um, so it's all about what's available and how you can make the most of it. But something that she's been doing as well for this spring split is using an opportunity to announce the team, have them involved, engage with the students, um, make the most of it, but also recognise their achievements. Um, she actually has two players on a Rocket League team that are at the highest level online um, within the ranked leaderboards. So it's given them that platform where they can show their achievements off and say, actually, I'm one of the best players in the world, or one of the best players in the world, yeah, um, in this game. Um, but it's also about connecting with them and having fun with it. They've also done things like 24-hour McMillan charity runs um, where they earn or they raised around £3,000, I believe, um, each time. So there's a lot of great opportunities to provide. And like I was saying as well, connecting with industry, uh, we were offered by the College Development Network to go along um, and to provide a platform for the students to, to play on a stage for the first time. Um, and they got the chance to actually see behind the scenes, speak to some of the, the broadcast and production team. And it was a fantastic day out. Um, to go and actually see what can go behind an actual esports event and running something that's on a national level. So when you're looking to, to set up within the school, there's a couple of different things that you can look at. There's this events checklist um, that you can run through, which is very handy for even just setting up for the student champs. Um, I can answer a couple of questions afterwards about the student champs, um, but for this esports events checklist. If you're looking to do something within the school or whether that's for the club outside of school, this is something that you should look at. Um, we put this together to help advise you along the way and make sure that you're fully prepared and know that all the right steps have basically been taking place. And especially off the back of what we've already done in Scotland is the College Cup. Um, so we, we've run the College Cup for two years now it's had a lot of great involvement and it's also looked to connect colleges down to students uh, within high schools as well. So there's a lot of great opportunities that are being developed um, and will be grown over the next few years. And then finally, I just want to touch on the eSports and Education Conference, um, which we're going to be looking to run again this year in March, where we're going to talk a bit more and get actually your input on this as well, of what you can uh, learn from it and what you have learned already. Uh, setting up clubs from a school level all the way up to a university level um, into research, but also have an industry presence at it as well at the same time. So it'll be a fantastic opportunity to 
get involved and, and see what else is happening out there by teachers that are in the space doing this already. And finally, I just have a video. So this was the after movie of our student championship finals. Um, so this is from school kids that came down to Confetti Institute and were able to, to enjoy the weekend. Thank you so much for joining us today here at the British Esports Student Champs Finals in the Metronome in Nottingham. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Everyone here at British Esports, I'd like to thank every single school that took part in the 2020-2021 season. Also want to congratulate our winners and finalists from today for League of Legends, Rocket League, Overwatch, and more than that to every single teacher and person that supports esports. Two 
champion. Too little, too late. Luxonate need a miracle. Sushi's trying to take it round the corner, but he's been dispossessed. Sam takes it. Luxonate Esports have lost their first series all season, and it is the championship final. AGSB are the victors. But like you've seen there, there's a lot of great examples of why students like to get involved and what they can get out of playing esports um, and the different opportunities that arise from it as well um, and it really is something that as your oyster as an educator um, to really explore um, and especially like we're saying it's such a young industry it's something that's emerging and it's being driven by young people and um, it's really one of these situations where young people are usually directing where this is going um, and that can vary class to class of what their interests are and where their interests lie um, but the best advice I can give is ask your students um, they'll know what they know about it they'll know what way you can or they can guide you to setting something like this up um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you you might have